Hello, this is Yara Stark and welcome to another Entrepreneur's Journey podcast interview. Tonight, on the line, I have uh, someone who already sounds very interesting. We've just been talking a little bit briefly before the interview so I can get my head around exactly what Farnoosh Brock does. And she does uh, two interesting things. Uh, we'll talk about them in a moment, but first let me welcome Farnoosh to the call. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, Yaro. So uh, Farnoosh is, as I just asked her, known for two things, which is the, uh, well, we were talking about the phrase exit strategy. And normally that means when you sell your company, but in this case, she's helping people exit from the corporate world to really discovering their passions and succeeding online and building an income stream around that. So that's number one. And then to totally flip it around, she's managed to find herself known for uh, the, the green juicing niche and uh, helping people in that space. So uh, both areas you're having success online with and building an income online with, Farnoosh, which we should definitely dive into in a moment. But first, can we go back in time and look into your, <laughs> your past? And in particular, I, I, you're Persian, aren't you? Yes, I am. Okay. I have, I have a friend who's Persian. I know it's Persian and not Iranian, to be accurate. Uh, it, it, he left I'm the fine country. with either. I'm you don't fine mind with either? That. Okay. <laughs> he, <laughs> he left the country when he was quite young and has uh, an amazing story regarding just getting out of Iran. Do you have something mm -hmm. similar to tell? Do you want to hear the story? I'd love to hear the story. <laughs> Yes. So everyone that you meet that has left Iran has some story. We are scattered all over the world. And so we left when I was 11 years old and it was in the middle of the war when Iran and Iraq were having this eight year war over absolutely nothing. But it was very disturbing <laughs> to the citizens. So we left with my family to go to Turkey, which was the only country that did not require Iranians to get a visa so we could go there. And we went there for a two-week vacation, and we never went back. So, yeah, my dad decided we're not going back. He was very, very stressed. It was really hard. I mean, there were, like, nightly bombings in Tehran where I lived. So it was a serious situation that none of us can fathom, including myself right now. But, um, yeah, we left for a two-week vacation Plus suitcases, my pregnant mom and my brother and my dad, and we left and we never went back. So he went back and kind of like cleaned things up a little bit and, you know, wrapped things up, wrapped up our whole life. And then we started life in Turkey. We lived there for three years, moved around a lot. And um, I wish I could say it was glamorous. When you look back, it, it sounds like that, but it was very hard. Three years for my family, very, very hard. And then we moved to the U.S., and the reason we moved here is because my dad used to live here when he was studying and my, my mom did to some extent too. And then my grandparents were here and my grandfather was very sick. So it was a good way for us to come here and uh, you know, then we stayed. We stayed and uh, we started living in the U.S. <laughs> I, I have to know how you survived in Turkey because it, it, it does sound amazing to just arrive with suitcases. And I know that's a common story for immigrants, certainly, yes. you know, go back 50 years, 60 years. Yes. Um, even my own parents, but I, I can't even fathom what it must be like to land in another country with no identity there whatsoever. Yes. You've given up your citizenship basically to, to be immigrants yes. like that. And then you have to make a living, find a place to, to mm -hmm. live, um, health care. Oh, yeah. how, do, how does that all work out? It was, it was hard. And the language, we did not speak the language. So on top of that, you know, Turkish is very, very different from Farsi. Uh, well, it was a lot of fortitude. My dad had a lot of vision, a lot of fortitude, and my mom did too. And I think that um, it, this shows you that when you put your mind to something, you can absolutely do it. We survived. Um, he spoke English, of course, you know. Um, he studied here. So he got a job teaching mathematics, which requires very little of the language, if you think about it. It's very common um, in uh, all languages in the world. At a private school so that my brother and I could attend that school. And um, so that sort of paid the bills, a very, very simple life. And then uh, my brother and I had to learn Turkish and then German because for some reason they taught German before they taught English and English at the same time. And it was um, really, really interesting. The first uh, few years were interesting. But, you know, we were so happy to not be in Iran and not be in the middle of a war and have some sense of freedom, even though we really missed our family. Iranians are very, very attached to their families and extended families and their friends. And so very lonely years. But um, 
we made it. So, mm. and you were eleven years yeah. old when this happened. Yes, I was eleven. Okay, so yes. then you three years, and then you're off to the states, was it? Yes, and yes, you, correct. You're arriving at fourteen, and and you do you know English by then? Yeah, well, I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I did. If you ask me, I'm like, yes, I speak English. I speak very well. Well, um, I spoke to get by. Uh, culture shock was very big, very big, especially in an American high school, if you can imagine it. Because even in Turkey, we still had uniforms and a lot of discipline. And, and I was used to that. And then um, you come to the American high school and it's a different world. So culture shock was worse than language barrier. But uh, it was... Um, it was really hard. Now you're making me think back about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can imagine uh, an Iranian popping into the, the set of Glee. That's what I'm thinking of right now. And because, you know, yes. Glee is the typical American high school. I don't know if it is, but <laughs> yes. maybe exaggerated. It, is. it was hard. It was hard. You know, I cannot tell you how many times I was asked, where are you from? Back then, it was just so unusual because I was in South Carolina. It's on the East Coast of the U.S., so they didn't have a lot of people. Like, it wasn't like New York or California where they had a lot of immigrants. And uh, I didn't really want to tell them I was from Iran. So that whole identity growing up, now I'm really proud to say it. I'm proud of my heritage. But back then, I would sometimes say I'm from Turkey. Sometimes I would try to not answer the question. It was really hard. I, I hated high school, like most other people. <laughs> okay, so... You blossomed after high school? Is is that yes. what happened? I think so. College was good. I, I studied electrical engineering because my dad said that's what I should study. And uh, that was really hard, but I did well. And I was on top of my class and I was just, you know, starting to really get to know myself and have some confidence. Have some confidence for the first time that I can do this because I could see other people having such a hard time. And it, it wasn't easy. But I was thriving. I was doing better every year and finding things that I wanted to do. Our life was getting better, you know, living in the U.S. year after year. Every year it was getting better. And I was just so grateful. You know, that's, that's the thing. The gratitude makes everything look even better because you remember where you came from, especially the closer you are to it. So um, I, I've just, you know, started seeing life getting better. Then I had a job. We finally got our green card. Mm -hmm. So... I was able to work, work, have a part-time job first and then a full-time job and internships and all that. So, yes, we definitely made it. And uh, we've all come a long way. I think it makes for a good story. Okay, so you entered the corporate world after that, I'm assuming, because you obviously now help people get out of the corporate world. So you must know <laughs> what it's like to be in the corporate world. Is that correct? Yes, but not directly, Yaro. I went to work for a startup at the beginning. Okay. And um, I know you have some interest in startups recently, right? Okay. If, I, if yeah. I know correctly. Yes. So I went to a startup that was doing fabulous. But a month into it, they announced that they got bought out by a huge semiconductor company in Silicon Valley and all of our dreams were dashed and it was funny but I stayed on I was there for 18 months so I had some startup you know really really small company experience before I went to a huge fortune 500 company and uh, that was a, still a good time I, I think I missed the the boat just like by a couple of years you know the whole stock shooting up to the roof but um it was still very good. It was still a very good company. And I really did have a good career at the beginning. I do want to say that. And I do want to say that I don't think corporate world is bad. I think that it can be the wrong place for you if you have certain symptoms or you are miserable or things aren't going your way in a certain way and you realize this is just not for you. That is okay. But corporate world in general, I, I, I love capitalism. I think it's a great thing that we have corporations and and places where people can go get a job. And, you know, so I don't think it's a bad thing. I kind of want to put that disclaimer <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah, you're putting it out there. I can see it's like, yes. don't want to burn bridges. Um, I, I'm curious, no. though, like you must have had, mm -hmm. I guess, pressure or at least an expectation um, or correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I don't know how inherently entrepreneurial uh, Persians are. Uh, so was the pressure more to get a job? Like it sounds like, you know, go to high school, go to university. Oh, get a yes. job, build a career. Is that what you were feeling from your, your family? Yeah. 
Yes, because you know what? And when I look back, I think that is how we define success because any other way, it just doesn't seem like it's possible or practical. I mean, in the Iranian culture, you may notice from your Persian friends, basically they consider certain professions as successful and, you know, a privilege to go into that. And, and parents always push their children in that direction. So engineers, which is what I studied, doctors, lawyers, professors. Those are pretty much the professions where if you tell other Iranians that's what you do, that's, you know, well, very well respected. Doctors and surgeons are number one. And uh, it's really, really hard because there is artists in these children. There is creatives, there is writers, and it's really hard to let, uh, to kind of blossom into that or have your parents' support. And um, I try not to really blame them because I think it's cultural. So... You know, my, my grandfather studied in France. He was a, a physicist. He wrote books. You know, he was very, very smart, very well regarded. And to him, math was the center of the world, right? So I think it's just cultural. So you're right. The expectation was to have top grades, high school, college, and then get a really respectable job with a respectable title and, uh, you know, just have a life that kind of shows and reflects that success. Right. So it sounds like obviously you would have seen your parents working very hard just from the immigration process and trying to survive in other countries. So you, you probably would have had a pretty good work ethic, I have to imagine, <laughs> from the beginning. Yes. What, how, like, where did this lead to leaving the corporate world? I, I can only imagine you sticking to it forever and you should still be there. So uh, <laughs> you're not, though. Yes. How did that no, all come about? No. It, it took it took a lot of guts because uh, I was very unhappy. You know, five years, six years into it, I started wondering what I'm doing here. And I kind of, I, I constantly wanted to climb up the ladder because I'm very, very ambitious. And I think the problem was, I don't think there's anything wrong with ambition. I think the problem was I was in the wrong place, as in the wrong environment, because I still have a lot of ambition, but it just wasn't the right thing. I didn't really grow up you know, in a way that cultivated me to respond well to bosses and management, especially when they did not promote creativity and all the things I was looking for. You know, I thought hard work was rewarded. And then you see that people who don't work as hard get promoted and get ahead. And, and that just questions you, you start questioning the system, right? You know, the first time you do that when you're in a place and you wonder if it's just a mistake or if it's just a fluke and then it keeps happening and it starts to make you doubtful and it starts to make you lose faith. And that's really terrible because I, I was in love with this company. I was, you know, this was my identity. I didn't want to associate with anyone who didn't work there and it was my whole life. And, and then I went from that to being completely jaded and I didn't like myself, you know, I just didn't like being this bitter, sarcastic person. And uh, it was really hard. So I was like that for another few years because I didn't realize I had options. I didn't realize there was, it was possible for me to leave, go to what other company would I go to? They were one of the best. I interviewed. I almost, almost got in Google. I was so close. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because then we had some family issues. My dad was very sick and I would have had to move to California. So it all works out. But how did I leave? Well, um, I just became too miserable. I think the pain just became too great. And uh, I was ready to, to take a risk, you know, give up my wonderful six-figure income that I did from home in my pajamas and my stock options and bonuses. And I love money. I have no qualms <laughs> saying that. We all do, but very few people admit it. I absolutely love money. So I had to give up a lot. But I found out that um, I can actually do something else. Like I actually had um, the, the beginnings of um, hope again that maybe something is possible thanks to the internet and to our world and technology today. And that happened at uh, Blog World 2010. Okay, so, so this is quite recent then. You, you've made this change in just the last few years. Oh, yes. I resigned May 2011. Okay, so you're, you're fresh. You fresh, yeah. freshly severed the, <laughs> the, the job. So uh, maybe go back then to, well, you're at the perfect place, 2010 Blog World. Take yes. us forward from that. 
Okay, so so by then I had been blogging a little bit just for fun. I started blogging actually, dabbing into it in 2006 and seven, not really doing much. And then 2009, I started prolific living, but it still was just a hobby. And I was just playing around and it kept picking up and things started happening that just made me wonder if this can be more, but never really seriously thinking about it. And then my husband pushed me, really, really pushed me to go to Blog World because it was in Las Vegas and he loves Las Vegas. <laughs> so I was very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm assuming and, um, he had a different motivation. Yes, he did. He was like, you go to this conference and I'll see you at the end of the day. And <laughs> so, But um, I was... Um, I was there and it was actually Darren who told his story, which I knew. I had read his story. I knew how he came about. And, but he said it. He was talking about it on stage. And he said how there was a moment when he realized this is it. He has to make it work. He, he moved from looking at his blog like a, hob, like a hobby to seriously thinking about it as a source of income or a living. And it's the way he said it. So it's, again, the Australian. <laughs> I'm really grateful to you guys. And um, something in me clicked. And I remember going to my husband and saying, what if I quit? And, and he freaked out because at the time we just didn't think this way. We couldn't give up a six-figure income and just, just do it based on a hunch, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that was October. So I came home and I started to make things happen. And I think by March, he had really seen that maybe, maybe there are things we can do. And on top of that, he saw how miserable I was. I, I really needed his support because we don't do things without really seeing eye to eye for the future. So, uh, so I, you know, came home, I started my newsletter, I created my first book, I started guest posting, I started getting out there, I started looking at my blog like my business. This is why you still had your job? I had my job. Oh, okay. yes. So you're doing this, this at is, night? I do this at night or during the day. This is the thing about my, my job. It was not really intense. So this is why everyone thought I'm crazy. I work from home. I had my own hours. And I probably worked maybe four hours a day on a busy day. It was really, really ridiculous. And I was a top performer because I really knew how to do my job well. So I still had work ethics and I really liked my bosses. So I, I did the work, but I just had issue with this whole spending my time doing something I didn't love. So I had plenty of time and, you know, I had 12 other hours to do something with. So I, I managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is like a, a perhaps a little bit of an unusual story in the sense that you had no strong, compelling reason to do your own thing or quit your job beyond the lack of passion in the work. Like the, the, it's, you know, it's not like you absolutely have to make something work financially because you've got a well-paying job. Yes. Yes. You, you, I'm assuming your husband is also employed and, and yes. um, you know, you've got a dual income family. So that's yes. less pressure as well. So you're you're making a decision purely on a uh, I just don't like what I'm doing with my life and I need to make a change. It's it's the original yes. the the original reason to to make a change. But often people make decisions more because of the money or um, because of the hours or or things like that. Those things weren't sure. just like you you could you could still be working your job right now, really, right? I could, I could, I probably couldn't put, because I put in a lot of hours right now. So I probably couldn't do that. And I, I see what you're saying. I think to people who haven't gone through this, it's really maybe um, something I could be doing, or it just doesn't make sense that I gave it up, or maybe I had it easy. But I think if you really put yourself in the mindset of someone who's been, I was in corporate 11 and a half years, and to really be so attached to the lifestyle and the income, you know, I made a lot of money. I had, you know, really, really nice income. And to be able to really walk away from that, even though we are surviving just fine because we have another income and now my business is making money. I think that alone, that was one of the hardest and easiest things I did. It, it was a huge shift. And I think if, if you can make that, that's great because your passion really deserves that. But um, I am, I just wanted to put that out there. It was, it was interesting um, transition for me. Which is what I like to talk about. Can you talk, what was your main goal then with <laughs> this project? Obviously listening to Darren and, yes. and you had a mental shift to making it into a yes. business. I, I'd like yeah. to know what your, your, what, what was your initial goal, especially at the point of quitting your job? Yeah. So it was not to waste my life. 
Okay, I know that sounds really dramatic. <laughs> That's pretty but big it really pictures. Was. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> well, I really was. Might be like deep. make make ten thousand a month from my blog. You know, something very I tangible and specific. Hundred. I want to make a hundred, and I will, and I will. You know, my business will make that much. But no, it was not to waste my life because, and and this is where, if we have any listeners who are in the corporate world and who are unhappy, they get this. Okay, so it, there comes a day where you cannot sit on another conference call listening to absolute gibberish for another hour, no matter how much they pay you, right? And remember, I love money. So this is the kind of transition I had, right? I thought I could do it for the money. I mean, there is just no, no way I could waste another hour when I could be doing something I love. And there were things I loved. I love to write. I love to connect with people. I love to see the reach my writing and my words and my message could have. I mean, there were things at the beginning, I didn't have this idea of putting this program together and writing this book. And I wasn't thinking that way. I was thinking, this is not right. And there is an opportunity here. There's a window of opportunity here for me to do something else. And my life is not eternal. And it's all of those things when they click and when there is enough pain, you make the decision. So I wasn't just moving away from the pain. I was also moving toward pleasure, if that analogy makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the pleasure was doing something I absolutely loved. I had found something which was giving me a, a, a taste of, of happiness again for work, which you forget when you're in a miserable job. You can be happy when you work and you can be happy when you work very, very hard if it's something you love to do. So I was, and I was learning and I was learning so much and I had stopped learning in my job. So when your brain stops to learn, a lot of things happen. You know, you, you lose your enthusiasm, you lose your excitement, you lose that beginner mindset. And so I was getting all of that back by delving into the blogging and marketing and business world. And I didn't have any of that in the corporate world. So it was a lot of transitions. Does that help you? Does that it help? It does. And, and I, I, I want you to continue the story. So what, how did you realize all of this? Take us through the, the process, especially yeah. the, the timelines. I really like timing this. So you're in 2010 blog world. Then what happened next? Yes. So October was 2000 and blog world. I came home and at the time it was just me thinking I'm leaving and my husband's like, no, you're not. So we were like that for a few months. And I started, like I said, I started writing my first ebook because I wanted to get something together for my newsletter, for my business, for, for my, you know, starting my newsletter. And then I started um, just, you know, studying. Like I started What's getting What's the subject, book- Farnoosh, for all of this? What, like- subject. Like what the was the niche step- you chose for your, your, your blog, your, your book, all these things? Yes. So this is the thing. And we're going to talk about like the green juicing niche that you mentioned, which came about quite accidentally, even though it happens to be one of my passions. I didn't have like a specific, I'm going to help this particular niche. My blog was prolific living and my, my, my tagline is smart habits for rich living. So I was really, really, really focused on building habits, building smart habits and creating a life that you love, which I know is general, but that was where I was going. For my first ebook, I wrote um, about writing. It was a writing manifesto writing skills, writing habits, just writing errors not to make. And, and I thought that writing, it's, it's the basis of all wealth. It's one of my favorite quotes. And because it applies to everyone, all of my readers are going to enjoy a book on writing. So, which was actually mm, sort of on spot, but not really. And, um, and so that was the first niche I went with, but, um, I, and then I expanded from there. So really, I mean, you can tell, right. It wasn't like a fully fledged, you know, vision, mission, strategy business. Right. So, right. Which is kind of funny considering you sound like, you know, you're well versed in, in that, like you have the education to realize I need a target market. I need a problem. I need to help people solve. Yes. Yet you yeah. sort of started a bit more generic than that. I started more generic and I was still figuring things out. So yes, I, I, analytically, I understand the importance of that in a business. You're absolutely right. But um, at the beginning, I didn't want to just rush and I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't know what I could offer. So even if I could you know, see all the opportunities, I didn't know what I could offer, what I wanted to offer. And I wanted to make sure it's aligned to my passion. And at the time, it was just writing. I was just writing on my blog. I was guest posting. I was, and I was learning. So I wanted to take the time to really take the, take the time to educate myself. Right. And I'm sure, you know, it takes a little time to figure things out. Right. Once you get into the mindset of this is a business, this is not a hobby right now. I'm not going to write about my day anymore. I'm going to write about something that's valuable to my readers. So, so I was still working in that. And then I start, I, I did decide on 
my first product at the beginning of 2011. So going back to timelines, 2011, I was going to write my um, travel book. And it was going to be a travel book in the sense that I was going to talk about helping people crush travel fears. Because I would meet people every day who would say, I would love to travel, but I can't. And people who don't want to leave their homes or their pets or anything behind, or they're scared of anything that might happen on the road. So I wrote this comprehensive book, four months it took me. And um, it was my worst product, right? I think it's brilliant, but it didn't do well, which was one of the hardest lessons. And um, it goes through, you know, crushing all your travel travel fears, building confidence, worksheets, master tip sheet to take with you, what have you, everything. So I did have the mindset of a product and I started learning how to create a product. So then back to timeline, January, February, March, I was working on my product and I was laying the groundwork to leave my job, but um, I didn't know when. And we were thinking after I get my nice big bonus in September of 2011. And then the, my work put me on this project. So this project from, well, I won't swear, but anyway, this project, <laughs> this project that was uh, really, really hard for me to do because it had to do with the upcoming layoffs. And I didn't want any part of that. And we were going to Hawaii for vacation. And I was torn. I hated the project. You know, my work didn't, it wasn't tolerable anymore. It became miserable. I had to get on these conference calls and work with people I didn't want to and do things I really didn't like to do. So I mustered the courage to go tell my boss, I want off this project. and I want to work on something where I can give some value. And she had no control over that. It came from higher up. And so we were in Hawaii and I decided to talk to my senior director. And you don't just go up and talk to your senior director if you're in corporate. Just, you know, if you haven't done that, you know, maybe, you know, Yaro, you would. But generally people don't. So I would be I, in corporate, I, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I went and, by the way, go and tell him, not, you know, thanks for the great job you're doing, but I don't want to do this project that you specifically ask me to do. And that's exactly what I did. And he said, well, <laughs> you know, basically he said, you don't really have a lot of choices. <laughs> And, uh, and then I came back home and I said, you know what I do. <laughs> so they put me between a rock and a hard place and that uh, was it. I walked away, you know, they just, you know, pushed me too hard and I wasn't going to compromise my integrity and work on a project that I absolutely didn't believe in. So, so that was the actual thing that happened behind the scenes. And and then I kind of gave myself, you know, a month to get ready. So this was end of March, April, getting ready. And I resigned uh, um, April 15th, U.S. tax day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and they so were you, you resign. And uh, let me, can you take me to the day you resign? Do you go home and just keep writing as, uh, for a prolific living? Is that what you did? No, I kept screaming. <laughs> Enjoy? <laughs> yes, yes. That was, it was a big deal for me. I mean, this is a huge deal for me. And this was where, you know, I was doing something where I didn't exactly have the full support of family and people who thought, okay, you know, Farnoosh is off to her next big accomplishment. This was like, what on earth? You know, what, what is she doing? And I had my full, the full support of my husband, full support. He was fully on board. This is what we're going to do. You're going to do whatever it is that you want to you know, create here and it's going to work. So I went to work and I, I resigned, did it very professionally and um, they were very surprised and I gave my usual two week notice. And then I came home and, you know, it took me a while to kind of pull myself together and kind of do the transition and the emotional, you know, exit for me because I have, you know, a huge network at work. So all the goodbyes and leaving. And so it was just, you know, one of those life transitions where you take time to reflect so I did that for a week or so. But then at the same time, my product was launching. My travel guide was launching and at the end of April. And I was very busy with that. So I kept working on that. And then I went to Blog World to, to speak. So I actually had that lined up, which was very exciting. Blog World in New York, 2011. And that was really good. That was on motivation. I spoke to people about just motivation and how you really can do the things you want to do. And then I went to WDS, a World Domination Summit in Portland. So I had a lot of excitement and building up my enthusiasm coming up as I went into the world of self-employment. Okay. I, I like the way, mm -hmm. I know I don't want to belittle your, your achievements here, but it, it sounds almost like you were in, it was inevitable that you'd make, make yourself a place in the vlogosphere and become well-known. And, and, and obviously, you're still building on this. But mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like there was ever a period where 
you know, you were sort of sitting at home struggling to get traffic to your blog, doing everything that people tell you to do to grow your audience, uh, and, and no one knows you, no one's listening to you, and no one's reading you. Right. Or maybe I'm wrong. Was there a period like that? No, things were going really, really well. So if you are you saying I could have like kept going with the corporate and continued uh, my... No, no, I'm just sort of, you mm. know, you quit your job and it sounds like you were, you ready just jumped from one from you know one plane that's moving you just jumped off it but you jumped into another one that's already flying you know you didn't have to build it up and, and take off uh, i know you were working on your blog and your writing mm-hmm. while you had the job and building the platform right. but it does yes. feel like you didn't go through the a long period of sustained struggle to build an audience online uh, is that right you are correct. I had attention. I had audience. I had built the foundation, the platform, and it continued to grow, but I wasn't making money. Okay, so just to get really honest. I'd love, I mean, I want to talk about money too, and we don't have tons of time, but I'm, it, it's, it's the hardest thing to do is grow an audience. How did you do it? Why was it so easy for you? Because I wasn't worried about it, I think. You know, at the beginning when I was building my blog, I didn't really worry about building an audience. I was just doing it for fun. And then my passion was feeding into it and I was building, you know, I I thought I was just making friends and having a good time. So when you're doing that, when I think that's the simplest answer, when you really take the pressure off and just do things because you really believe this is going to be a message that's worth spreading, that's worth writing about, you know, the way you write your blog posts and the way you connect with people without really expecting them to do a business favor to you in return or something like that. I mean, it grows organically. And I had time, you know, I mean, this did not happen overnight. So if I started in 2009, you know, it had time to build up and to index in Google. And, you know, I was doing a lot of guest posting. So I think both a combination of time and not having the pressure and being so passionate about it because I had the day job and then I had an outlet. So I think that combination really worked well. Then when I quit, I put the pressure on myself. And that actually, you know, if we continue the timeline, my summer was really hard emotionally because I didn't, things didn't exactly work. You know, my first product didn't work. My first attempts didn't work at making money. The blog was growing. Yes, the audience was there. The attention was there. And I was getting pretty well known in the blogosphere, you know, for, for my, you know, from different places, you know, recognition stuff, but the money wasn't coming in. And that's the pressure I put on myself. I hope that answers your question. Yes, if not, please yes, ask does. me again. <laughs> no, okay. I understand. Okay. It, it, it sounds like you did some good fundamentals of blog marketing. So you, you maintain your content, you were doing guest writing. I like the way you said you were making friends, which is kind of like you were saying, you were yes. just talking to other bloggers. You were probably doing interviews like we're doing now. And yes. you built this platform while doing your job, which is fantastic. Cause, and like you said, it was passion-based. So, okay, but you're not making money. Pretty big deal after quitting your job. How did you fix that? <laughs> Right. And that was a hard one. So my travel guide, which I think is still a brilliant product, but you know, um, it didn't do well. And it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about how to go about creating products, how not to go about creating them. I'm saying, you know, it didn't make a lot. It still made some money, right? It still hit a little four figure uh, income. And um, I was happy with it. I paid my design fees off, you know, it was fine. And then I started and I was all about creating products because all my life, I had wanted to have something in my name. I thought, you know, if I can create something and I didn't think it was possible, but now with the internet it's so possible. So I was thinking, what am I going to create next? And the next product. Before you tell me your next product, what Mm -hmm. was wrong with the travel guide launch? Like what was the biggest lesson you learned? Good, good, Good question. It did not relate to my audience. And even though I have it started to think beyond my list, my, my reader's audience. I think your audience is really, you know, a lot bigger than just your blog readers. But I think I just misread them. You know, I, I did a survey. I was, you know, reading comments, but they weren't really coming to my blog to read about travel. Now I know a year later, I know that they come to my blog to learn about confidence and motivation and building self-esteem and overcoming fears. But a lot of my audience wasn't interested in travel and uh, I just misread them. It was just, I missed it. I missed the, the mark with them and it didn't do well. Okay. So I still had them following and coming on board and, you know, grabbing the writing manifesto and reading my blog post. But I just really missed the mark on that. And it took me a long time to admit this, but I'm perfectly fine admitting it because I really believe just like, you know, when you really put your heart and soul into a product and one day you're going to find the right market for it. I really believe I just didn't have the right market. 
Okay, so how did that take、uh, part of the next product? You must have. So then, so, yeah. Go ahead. go ahead, please. I was just going to say you must have learned that lesson, so you didn't make the mistake twice. Yes. So the next product went much, much better. I started focusing on another passion, which is really health, natural health, a natural way of reclaiming your health, your energy, your your vibrant self. And、um, this is where I started basically getting a little creative. I do a lot of yoga, but I'm not a yoga certified teacher by any means. And I do. I've done a lot of different exercises and aerobics and cycling and kickboxing all my life, right? Combination of different things, and I wanted to make this accessible. My whole thought was, how do I make health accessible to anyone? From my twenty-year-old inflexible student to my sixty-five-year-old reader, how do I make it so accessible that they think that's what I want to do? And how do I make it accessible so that the busy professional has time to do it? So I came up with ten-minute invigorator system, where I did these eight videos, and it's all a combination of yoga, breathing, and movements, body movement. But I didn't call it yoga because I didn't want to. Scare people away, even though you know you don't think yoga is a scary word. It is for people who are not familiar with it, and for people who think you have to be a flexible、uh, gymnast to do yoga. So I created these ten-minute segments where you could do it at home, where you don't need any equipment, you don't need any experience. I modified it for them, and at the end of that, you have energy, you have you know just a, flex- a little more flexibility, you have. Just you know, had had a little, a few beads of sweat, and、um, it's possible for anybody to do it. And that one did so well. I mean, it was so Now, wh- popular. Why? Like, I, I I don't see like to me, they both sound a little bit left of the center when it comes to the subject of your blog at the time, because you weren't talking about、yeah. health for every every article on your blog. It wasn't a health blog, was it? But then you're selling a no, health product. Was- No, and I didn't position it that way. I positioned it as a, and I. And you're right. I don't talk about health. I talked all about about my experiences with, you know, food. But like I was doing a lot of vegan raw food experiments. I was doing, you know, habits and challenges, and they're all about making myself better. And I was doing some yoga videos on the side, so they knew that I am familiar with yoga. I positioned this not as, you know, health. I positioned it more as overcoming fatigue. You know how you come home, you don't have the energy as making. Making yourself better, making yourself happier. You know, this is going to help with your, with your、um, spirits, with your mindset. And so, it wasn't like you know, get healthy. I actually don't think I used that word anywhere. It was about invigoration. It was about you know that overcoming the afternoon slump. It was about making you know, just getting you know through the day with more energy. And people associate a lot of me with a lot of energy. So maybe that clicked with them. I, and I did a beta testing with this product, which might have been a good idea with the other one, where I had oh, I think a dozen people go through it at the beginning, give me feedback, tell me really how they felt about it, and then launch the real one. Did a lot of marketing, a lot of you know buzz building, just natural, organic because I don't you know I'm not a marketing expert, and、um, somehow it clicked. Somehow it was maybe the summer. It was about getting. Healthier, but also doing it in an accessible way to everyone, and it clicked with people who never ever do yoga, never ever do anything with health. Like the people who bought it, you know, some of them had never even gone to the gym. So I think maybe it made it possible for people to do something they hadn't done. It just gave them another glimmer of, you know, moving in the right direction in their life. Maybe not so much health, but just. I do see how it's sort of starting to turn towards. Motivation and productivity, and all, albeit、okay. it's from the health angle, but it all comes down to being productive <laughs> and and getting things done, and and yes, where travel、right. isn't necessarily tied into that. It's more the outcome.、Uh, <laughs> it's something maybe you should be selling on the back end when people have already succeeded, and now this is will be how you travel. But I I know it sounds like okay, you learned a lot from the first launch. You did the second one better, but. I do get the feeling it's still a little bit of you know what I like this subject. I'm gonna, I know people are responding in some way to this subject area. Let's、mm-hmm. make a product and see if it does better.、Mm-hmm. Is there、mm-hmm. a little element、right. of that? Yes, and and you said something about、uh, productivity. I think it was a lot around time management too, time management. because a lot of the people that are, you know, a lot of people want to be healthy. They want to be productive. They want to do everything, but there's no time. And if you want to go to the gym, you have to set aside hour and a half, two hours. And so, 
This was just another accessible home program where you could really do it, but it wasn't your usual, you know, doing abs or doing weights. It was a completely unique routine. So maybe that was also an angle that attracted them, right? Okay, so did you get rich? Yes, very. I am <laughs> just talking to you here from my Hawaii villa, and uh, life is good. <laughs> oh, not quite, not quite, but I got confident. I got more confident and I was really happy. Can you sort of share sales numbers? Because it's really interesting to hear, you know, how, how income grows over time too. Like each launch gets better. Yes, 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 yes. You know, I, to be honest with you, and, I, and I, I'm not saying it's not to share, I actually don't know exactly how much I made. I know it was maybe 2000 maybe 2000 and it was a 47 to $27 product. Okay. Okay. So I think in numbers it was good. And, um, I had some affiliates and it was a big launch. It slowed down after that. It was a big launch, slowed down. And, um, I think that's around the, 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 the um, the sum. Okay. So definitely not rich, but I went from making nothing to making that from a product. So to me, it was a success. But I can tell for Anush, you would be very hungry still, especially because you're on a six-figure job. $2,000 from one launch is not good enough, right? Not yet, not yet. But you know what? It gave me the confidence. I was really in a bad place that summer because I was feeling really low on my confidence. And you know, it was a huge transition. You know, I was sure the corporate world is behind me. I'm never going back. But what to do? So that gave me the confidence. And it, it made me very happy because I helped people. Like I actually gave them something that they valued. So I finally got what people mean when they say that. Okay. So Next. Next. So then we are in September and I had a lot of travel coming up. A lot of travel coming up actually around, coming up around your part of the world. The first we went to, um, where did we go in September? I think we went to Asia and um, I started thinking about, my coaching was picking up a little bit. So on the side, I was doing some coaching, mostly life coaching, but some business coaching. And I was getting some ideas from my coaching clients. You know, I was attracting were, were a lot of people. clients coming from your blog? They were, yes, everything was coming from my blog. I wasn't marketing anywhere else. So I had random clients here and there, you know, for life coaching. But then I started getting, attracting people because I started talking about my transition from work. I wrote a few articles that really hit it big. The, like a life hacker uh, one time uh, linked to me and some other places where a career minded blogs linked to me. And I attracted people who are in corporate, who are in the same position, who saw what I had done and somehow could relate. You know, it's one thing to, you know, look at a uh, 20 year old entrepreneurs who make it really big, but to relate to someone who went through the corporate world and make that transition. So I started to identify with some people and they became my clients and I started helping Helping them with the way that I started looking and leaving the corporate world or starting a side hustle at the same time or thriving in their corporate job because, you know, I, I had a lot of um, experience in that because at first I didn't and then I figured out how. So I started attracting a different kind of, uh, of crowd into my coaching business and that was taking off and, and I realized how passionate I am about helping people. So I started putting the foundation of my course together, my Smart Exit Blueprint course, but it was a while before I offered it. So I was doing that, but at the same time, I was getting a lot of traffic from Google, completely accidental, on green juicing. <laughs> and um, you mentioned this earlier, right? And this was a blog post that I wrote that has probably now had 100,000 hits on it, wow. which is pretty good. You know, every day it gets a few hundred still going strong from 2009. And one day I decided I should do something about this. You know, <laughs> I just decided, you know, maybe we can do something. And the more I did, the more it kept growing. So it just seems like, you know, I was meant to do something with green juicing. So I started a newsletter just on green juicing. I started an autoresponder series, just giving people tips on green juicing. And I started creating videos and just doing something on the side as I was growing the blog. And I thought of this as my experiment in the niche market. And um, then I, uh, we were on a plane to Australia. So we were coming down there and to New Zealand for a few weeks. And I wrote my green juicing book, for in, in the course of two weeks while on vacation in your lovely country. And it is my best selling book. And I cannot understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, I think it is really showing you the power of a niche when people really, really know what they want and they go for it and they find something, you know, because I believe in the quality of the products I make. I just hadn't hit the right market. And with the green juicing book, I did. 
So at first, I was selling it on my blog. And I hope this is the direction you wanted our conversation to go. Keep going. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. So I created the green juicing book. I finished it up in New Zealand. I remember because the internet was so choppy that it took me, you know, all night to get it online. And then I woke up in the morning and the sales were coming in. And I just put it on my blog at the beginning. And it was a $27 package again. And I had a green juicing audience by then, only 500 people, but they were very focused. And this is where it tells you the power. I don't think it's so much in the numbers as it is in the quality and the focus of the numbers. And so I started selling the book and then it kind of slowed down and picked up, you know, every day I would sell a few, but the launch was good. I think that was probably a little over 2000. It was still, you know, a $27 product, but, but it was good. And then what we did when we came home in January, we put that book on the Kindle store. Amazon Kindle store. I also enrolled it in the KDP Select, which is the Kindle Direct Publishing Program, which is a boon to all publishers out there. It's so is Amazon Kindle. I mean, it's just brilliant that we have that opportunity. And nothing happened the first month, you know, just a few sales. But then after that, it started picking up. And it's been selling, you know, a good few hundred copies a month and really, really doing well. And it's the number one green juicing book and even ranks for juicing, just juicing mm -hmm. in uh, Amazon. And it's really, really amazing. And, and I'm so glad that um, that happened because I just was looking for some place where I was thinking, okay, this really, really works. And it's really helped a lot of people. You know, I've actually converted quite a few people to green juicing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. It does. It's amazing how it, it's like you started a blog purely for the sake of starting a blog, and then all these little niches have popped up out of it. You know, you've you've had a travel guide that yes. okay didn't do so well, but you you learned a lot. You start yes. consulting because people start asking you for advice on whether they how to leave their job or how to do better in their job. Then you have some success with you know exercise DVDs, uh, and mm -hmm. then now juicing, and it's it's almost like you see something pop up on your blog, and you say, "Why not go after it?" And if it's doing really right. well, go further with it, as you have done with the juicing. So, is it safe to say right now, you know, your main mm -hmm. income sources are from selling your juicing products and the consulting style products? Is that right? Mainly, yes, mainly. I also started offering some select advertising on my blog, and I started that actually last year. I have some advertisers that I work with, mainly in the UK, and uh, I'm very selective on you know what I advertise and how I do it. But I do have some steady income from that, and that's mainly, I believe, part of the traffic, right, and part of you know my publishing style. So, so I do have that. I have some affiliate income, but not very much. I have the juicing, I have the coaching. You're absolutely right, and then I also have the smart exit blueprint so i did launch that course that i mentioned to you which helps professionals choose a direction when they hit this sort of a career crisis and um, it's not necessarily out of the corporate world it's really out of a miserable job so if they want to stay you know i help them find the right place in the right company but um if they want to leave then we also work on that and that did that did okay for the beginning i had eight students but that was a $250 course. So, you know, it was um, more focused, more intense, and I'm getting ready to offer that again. So it's been different, different streams of income, but you're right. Those are the different pockets. Okay. Now, Farnoosh, I'm noticing a trend here. You have not been doing this for that long on, on a grand scale. Uh, you know, you, you went to Blog World 010, though you were blogging before <laughs> that. You didn't quit your job <laughs> till literally last year as we record this. Yes. And <laughs> yet you have managed to release quite a few products, do a bunch of coaching programs. Now, I know yes. what goes into often, at least, at least, you keep saying the word launch as well, so that there's a lot that goes into a yes. launch. You need to have yes. a copy written for the sales page or maybe the sales video yes. needs to be produced. You need to have email sequences. You need to attract affiliates yep. and have a system for them to use yep. and, and promotional tools. Um, you know, you need to create the products themselves and then get the oh, nice yeah. graphics with them and the covers and, and do the formatting and, and then you need the coaching calls and there's a lot there. How, how big is your team and how are you getting all this done so quickly? <laughs> 
it's so nice that someone realizes that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even tell you all my products. You know, I, I wrote a motivation book and then I created a confidence series program this month, which is super popular with my with my audience. And that's how I know that's what they want. It goes, a lot goes into it. It's just me. It's been me. And that is actually not something I advise because I believe that you really need to be able to delegate the right things. Maybe not the content creation, the intellectual intellectual part of your process, but, um, I wanted to do it at the beginning because I wanted to learn. I had my brother, my younger brother, helping me with all the technical stuff. So he was my IT guy on the blog. I'm sorry, on the blog, yes. And so he was doing that and he was taking 20% of gross. So, you know, it worked out well for both of us. And then he just transitioned off and my husband is now supporting me on the IT front. But um, I did some, some delegation on transcriptions for my course and I'm glad I did. But I did all of it because I wanted to learn Yaro. I wanted to really push myself. I wanted to be really involved in the process. So I get really close to it, really get intimate with it. Like my goal isn't to just, you know, create a big company. I want to really understand how this works and what works and what doesn't. And I just love it. So it's been hard, hard working year. I've never worked this hard in my life and never been happier ever. Okay. So it's safe to say this is more hours than your corporate job was. Yes, that's that a safe it. bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, so you, I'm you, it. you you write your copy, yeah. you you format all your ebooks, yes. you mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. do all your blog posts, you you yes. yeah, okay, so you're not not quite a one woman show, but you do you really show what's possible. And I know for a lot of people they they can find that inspiring. I, everyone hears about delegation and outsourcing and that makes your life easier yes. and you can get passive income and sit on the beach and work for a couple of hours, but I think there's yeah. good value in knowing that it is possible to do all of this yourself. It may not necessarily be the the most time free way of doing it, but like you said, you get to know your subject. You you really get yes. uh, become a subject matter expert at the process as well as what you're um, teaching. So, yeah. you, and clearly you're good at productivity. I can tell you know you're you're teaching in that area, so you're obviously good at it yourself. But Thank you. we're, we're almost at the end of uh, I guess our time mm-hmm. frame here for our new show. I'd I'd, I'd just yes. like to maybe look at. Um, mm-hmm. What's the secret to that? Like, how can you produce so much? And what and what do you think that makes you special? Is it your focus on action? Mm-hmm. Green juicing is the secret. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but health is huge. Health is huge. I, I you know, I, I say that one seriously. If you take care of yourself and if you are doing something you love, a lot of things that seem to block your energy will fall into place. I can promise you that one, right? Because we have a lot more energy than we really, really allow to release. And this really is sort of not a function of your age. You know, I know people who are much, much older than me and have a lot of energies because they just align what they need to do to their passion and they take care of themselves. So this doesn't mean go on a diet and exercise. It means whatever is true for you, take care of yourself. So I really think taking care of myself really helps. And also I I, I took some action and I'll be quick on this because I don't want to go over, but I decided to uh, to remove some things from my life. You know, I basically changed, um, gave up my um, uh, social life to some extent, even though I'm very happy. I have a very engaged online life. I gave up, you know, activities, gave up a lot of things I would do that I don't do anymore so it takes really setting some priorities maybe making some sacrifices and making a deal with yourself right because you can't do everything but you can do anything you set your mind to you just cannot do absolutely everything so I made some priorities some huge shifts and really became clear on where every minute of my time goes so I think if you just do that I think that pushes you a lot further closer to your goal uh, right. uh, which leads me to the next question. You probably do want to have some kind of social life at some point again. So <laughs> I don't see this as a permanent situation where you, you want no. to do the kind of hours you are doing now. What's the plan? Get every single product out of your head and then settle no. back a bit? Or <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> That's that's a good that's a good question. No, I don't think that, you know, you should give up your social life altogether. I do have some, but I think I just, you know, I'm so passionate about what I'm doing right now. I'm so focused. I'm just following the energy. I I know this is not sustainable. I don't want to work 18-hour days forever, even though I don't think sitting on the beach and drinking those drinks is really the way to go either. I think you need to do some work 
in the course of a day to feel like you've accomplished something. So, so I, I really subscribe to that. But I think the idea is to build up my passive income, you know, to, to do it in such a way that that comes in and I then become more selective on what I do. Right. So there are some things I still want to get done. I really want to launch my course again. I really want to write more books. I really want to, you know, get get more out there with the community and and, you know, write guest posts and stuff like that. But but I think, yes, it's not sustainable. And I'm moving towards a direction where I want a lot of income from my own lines of products and services. I want the brand to be out there. And and then I want to start delegating. I want to start doing some smart delegation to people that I can truly trust. So if anyone is listening and wants to help me, (laughs) no, I'm kidding. Um, And I think, yes, I need a sustainable model. I absolutely, absolutely subscribe to that. And the shocking thing is that we're getting my husband ready to quit his job too. So... And that is going to really um, be uh, be an interesting transition for us. A pressure point, another pressure point. Yes. Okay. Well, so. it, it sounds like an exciting future. I feel like we've only caught you halfway through this journey, if that even. Uh, but thank you. If, if anything, you know, you, you point out and demonstrate what you can achieve in a, a short period of time when it comes to establishing a platform and a brand and your name out there and leveraging that in all kinds of niches and to be honest it sounds like i know i know you're you're doing surveys and you're researching what people want but i get the mm-hmm. feeling like you just pick subjects you're interested in and, and have something to teach about and and yes. then go find the customers so that's a wonderful way to do it if you can because you always get to in, indulge in what you're interested in at the time and you make yes. the time and uh, have the energy to keep producing which is amazing because i know i personally get a lot of ideas too like i've got an article on my site that's doing really well for uh, buying and selling websites. And I could go and create a list on that and a course on that. But I go, you know what? I just can't focus on that because I'm focusing on my startup. Yes. So um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm impressed how many things you can get done, <laughs> Farnoosh. Absolutely. So. No, I, I think, thank you. No, I think you, you have done quite well for yourself, Yaro. And we are very, very honored to have you as part of our community. But um, no, I think it's really possible. You just have to really get clear with yourself and really get focused. I think I, I, I don't really consider myself a big success. I really, you know, always look for bigger and better. But I think, you know, you can. I really, really hope that you're listening take away a lot of hope that whoever they are, wherever they are in their life, they can totally create something and it starts to build on itself and you get support from people you don't even know. And it's, it's an amazing opportunity we have. So you really have to take advantage okay. of it. Farnoosh, let's end with one last question, which is probably the most relevant for uh, your stage at the moment. If there's a person listening to this and they are considering quitting their job like you have done, what mm-hmm. do you think are the most important things to have in place at the point Mm -hmm. of quitting do you think it's uh, I don't want to answer the question for you but I know most people are worried about Mm -hmm. the money side as the first part so a big nest egg saved up do you recommend that or something else um Yes, yes, very good question. And I totally get the money uh, issue. I work with that all the time. I think it's really important, first of all, to know why you're quitting. This is the first exercise I go through with everyone because you may think you, you know why, but you don't know because you don't want to recreate the conditions that brought you here. So when you're really clear on why, then you start creating the direction you want to go. And yes, you have to have your financial house in order. You have to be out of debt. You have to have some sort of income coming in, especially if you need it. Some households can do without, but you have to have some of that in order. But I think that's um, that's that's not so interesting as what it is that's moving you away from your job and what you want to do. Because sometimes you're just bored and you need to just switch things up. But if you really have a drive to do something else, that's the exercise I would do a self-examination, if you would. Ask yourself why you're really quitting. So once you figure that out, yes, the financial house has to be in order. How much? That depends on your condition, on your lifestyle, on the changes you're willing to make in your lifestyle. But I think the more important thing I want to draw everyone's attention to is why are you quitting? Why do you want to leave? And it's a very hard question and no one wants to answer that. But I think that gets you to that, that gets you closer to your path, to your true path that hopefully gets you to where you really want to go. Okay. Thank you, Farnoosh. Uh, websites, where can we find you? Um, prolific Living. Prolificliving.com. That brings you to me. You can contact me. I answer every email, and I would love to connect with your listeners, Yaro. Thank you so much. I'm so honored that you took the time to speak to me today. 
Oh, well, thank you for coming on and, and sharing the story so far, Fonush. And I, I wish you good luck. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that we're going to be hearing so much more from you because you get so much done. So uh, <laughs> it's kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a baking cookies ebook that I want to get a hold of at some point. So um, you get a free copy. Thank <laughs> you. Yara. You're too thank kind. You. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, so check out prolificliving.com for more from Farnoosh Brock. And obviously there's uh, green juicing if you're into that or want to quit your job if you're into that or exercise or motivation or travel. It's all in there. Uh, and if you want more interviews like this with Farnoosh, other um, entrepreneurs like her who have quit their job and started some sort of online business, please head to my blog, entrepreneurs-journey.com or Google my name, Yaro, Y-A-R-O, and you will find all the podcasts uh, like this one. So thanks again and thanks, Farnush, and we'll speak to you on another call very soon. Bye-bye.